Um, there's a lot of things going on in, in uh, church life this Christmas season. I, uh, they're all written in the bulletin. Uh, I don't have anything that's, I uh, don't know of anything that's not written uh, written down. So if you check your bulletin for the uh, announcements, I'd like to welcome all the visitors. Glad to have you all and uh, come worship with us this morning. And is there anything else that needs to be announced? Okay. Brother David is on his uh, annual trip to... Uh, Panama City, I knew it was in Florida, <laughs> Panama City, uh, Florida, and we're blessed to have Ms. Ron to speak this morning, and uh, look forward to what she has to say. Yes. Okay, where at? In the back room, okay. Did everybody hear that? Uh, Christian sisters briefly after service in the back room. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Amen. 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 Did he? And so we are still praying and watching for him to come and get us home. We thank you for him for his teaching and for all that he's done. Let's see. It's in here is. Yeah, it says the 23rd, I think. Yeah, 23rd, so. So that would not be next Sunday, but the Sunday after that, right before I Christmas. Okay. <laughs> we'll make it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Next Saturday, I know it's in the bulletin, but it's uh, real important. We're having our Christmas program practice at 6. So those of you who have children that are involved, if you could have them here um, Saturday night at 6, it would be Anything else? I'll turn the service over to Ms. Rhonda. So Luke chapter 2. Verses 8 through 15. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch o'er their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. By the, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. As we light this second candle, this is the candle of the shepherds. We remember to spread the good news of our Messiah's advent. May we, like the shepherds, go and tell the good news to everyone that will listen. We welcome our Savior, the mighty God, to this earth and into our hearts. We pray that everyone will experience the peace of Christmas, which is the peace that Christ brings to us as well. Father, we just thank you so much for this day. You've created this day. It belongs to you. And Lord, last week we remembered hope, and we lit the candle of hope, and today we remember the shepherds. And Lord, as we remember each and every part of the Advent season, Lord, we know that there's reason to praise you. We praise you and we worship you for hope that you give us. Nothing can take hope away from us if we won't allow it. 
Nothing can allow us, just like the shepherds, nothing can keep us from seeing your glory if we don't let it. And so today, Father, I pray that you would be glorified and worshiped. I pray that you would let hope rise in our hearts like it's never been before. And that today you would help us to see your glory and to have a heart of worship for you as we've never had before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Paul. <clears throat> Let's sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. Turn in your hymnal to number 566 or follow along on the screen as we have responsive reading. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And answer me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou strength forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the words of thine own hands. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Blessed is the reading of the word. Hey, Paul. Oh, come all ye faithful.
It's time for our tithes and offerings. Ushers, if you'd please come. Our scripture today is one that pertains to both praise and worship and obedience. And the word of the Lord does instruct us to give, and it's very specific as to what we give, both tithes and offerings. And so I just want to encourage you today to search your heart and obey the Lord so that it may go well with you. Let's pray. Father, everything under heaven and earth is, is yours and it already belongs to you. You don't need our money so that you can function. You need our obedience so that we can be blessed because that's your heart is to bless us. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand this in a new way today so that we can live a blessed and abundant life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
stand, please. Praise God, the God of hope, our blessings flow. Praise Him, our creatures here below. Praise Him, above. Be seated. Brother James, you had me singing in Latin. That was beautiful. Thank you. I'd like for us to go to prayer now. Um, it's not on our order of service, but I'd like for us to just pray for the needs of those that are here this morning. If you have a need, we don't have to make it known to each other for God to know what our need is. And so as we pray, I just Ask that you just lift up your heart to the Lord and ask him to heal, to help, to deliver, whatever your need is. God's desire is to answer it. And so if, if you know someone who's lonely, if your heart is breaking for someone, share that heartbreak with the Lord. Give it to him. The word says cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Why does he want us to cast them on him? so he can take care of them for us. So let's bow in prayer now. Father, I ask for you to know the heart of every person in this building today. I ask for you to love our sick loved ones. I pray for you to heal those who are sick in body. Lord, I pray that you would apply the stripes that you took on your back for us. And Lord, we believe, we believe that you have taken care of sickness for us. And we just trust you with our sicknesses and with our diseases, Lord, because we know you've already paid a price for them. Please help us to believe so that our loved ones and so that we can be made whole. Father, I pray that you'd help where there's lack. I pray for you to bless. Lord, where there, there are those who are lonely, I pray that you would be their friends. Where there are our loved ones who are traveling, I pray for traveling mercies. Father, I pray for protection where protection is needed. I pray for deliverance where deliverance is needed. You know every care and every need, that, need that's on our hearts today. And I ask that you would do what you do best, and that is meet every need that we have. We leave these things with you, Father, knowing that they're in good hands. And so we don't have to worry. We don't have to stress, and we don't have to figure things out. We can just give it to you trust you and wait for you to supply for us we ask these things in jesus precious name and as the lord taught us to pray we say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, Sister Shirley and Brother Andy, would you please come? Children, would you please come for the children's sermon? Thank you. 
Now, have you ever seen somebody who's pregnant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're kind of big, kind of fat. Yeah, yeah, kind of big. Can you imagine riding on a donkey when you're big and fat and pregnant? Those of us who've been pregnant can imagine, and we didn't, would not want to do it, correct, <laughs> ladies? Not a fun thing to do. Well, I got to thinking about it, and this is the only donkey in my house. I don't remember his name, so some of you... Eeyore, thank you. <laughs> that was every adult out there knew the name, and the kids up here couldn't remember it. Eeyore was not the donkey that Mary rode when she was pregnant with baby Jesus, but I got to thinking it was pretty neat. You know, there's a story called the legend of the donkey. Donkeys are kind of low-life creature, creatures. Yeah. Off the Off those for the star, that's absolutely right. Donkeys are kind of low-life creatures. They're not real cute. If you have a choice between riding a donkey or a horse, which are you going to ride? Probably the horse because he's pretty and can run fast and all that kind of stuff. But donkeys are good servants. They're very obedient, and they carry loads for us human beings all the time, just like when they carried Mary with a baby Jesus on their back. But do you know that when Jesus had lived his life, and it came time for him to return to Jerusalem, not to be counted, but because he was going to be crucified. Do you know what animal he chose to ride on? A donkey, absolutely. And the legend of the donkey tells a tale. If you look at the back of this donkey, can you see a seam right here and a seam right here? Do you know that on the donkeys that live in Jerusalem, that live in the Holy Lands, those donkeys have something on their back <coughs> where those seams are. Can you look at that? Oops, I don't know if you can see that. Can you look at that picture? What does that kind of look like? A donkey. A donkey with a, say it louder, Cooper. Cross. With a cross, absolutely. This is a special breed of donkey that grows in, that lives in Israel, and many donkeys in the United States have these too, but they have a cross on their back. I thought that was pretty nifty that Jesus before he was even born, when he was in his mother's womb, rode on a donkey that already had a cross on his back in the same way he left when he came back to Jerusalem before he was crucified. Pretty neat, huh? So donkeys, even though Eeyore is kind of a goofy-looking guy here, donkeys carry a very important place in Scripture. Did you know that? Oh, we learned something new about Christmas, didn't we? Something you can tell at your house. Pretty neat. Does anybody want to pray today? Yes, sir. Um, you got a question? I don't have a question. I just want to ask you about the donkey. You want to ask me later? A donkey for a thousand guys? That would be a lot of donkeys. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a thousand donkeys. I can only see one or two donkeys at a time in pastures around here. Because mm -hmm. they chase off coyotes, that's what I'm told. Hmm. Mr. Andrew, would you like to pray for us? Father, we just would like to thank you for being the God you are and uh, putting all this together for us, Lord, the earth, the air we breathe, the universe, the stars, stars, sky. Father, we just thank you for sending your only begotten son to uh, come here to us. He gave up everything.
Congregation, would you please stand? It's our custom to bless the children every Sunday here. Lord, we thank you for our precious children. I just ask that you would just cover them with the blood of Jesus and protect them. Lord, we just ask you to bless them as they lie down and as they rise up, as they come in and go out. Everyone who has authority over these children, Lord, I pray that they would have favor in their eyes. I pray, Lord, that you would put in them a heart to worship you, put in them a heart to please you and to love you. Put in them, Lord, we bless them with a heart to love what's right and hate what's wrong. And we ask, Lord, at their very earliest age of understanding that they would receive you into their hearts and that they would live and walk with you all the days of their lives. Bless their homes and their families. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Miss Shirley, have something for you? Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Andy and Shirley, and children, for coming up. I heard another preacher say um, recently, within the last few months, that he does something that I do, and I've never heard of anyone else doing it. But for most of my life, during the Christmas season, I've asked the Lord, what does he want for Christmas? And um, usually the Lord says, Something like, forget something, let go of something, (laughs) Um, trust him with something, and um, maybe the Lord puts on my heart to do a project that I hadn't really wanted to do, (laughs) and goes ahead and nudges me to go ahead and obey him and do what he wanted me to do. And this year, a few weeks ago, I was sitting and I was thinking that it was, you know, getting close to Christmas, and I was thinking that it was getting close to time to ask the Lord what he wanted for Christmas. And as I was just thinking that, the Lord put in my heart to teach about a heart of worship. At the time, David hadn't even asked me to preach this morning, but I knew that an opportunity would come. So I've been thinking about this for a really long time, and what that means is that this is going to take about six hours. So, no, I'm kidding. (laughs) Um But I really do feel like this is God's heart for us this morning, church. And uh, visitors, we're so glad that you're here. And um, God knew that you would be here, all of you, those of us who are here every week and those of us who it's their first time. But I feel like this is God's heart for us this morning, and that is for us to understand that it's God's desire for us to worship him. And worship, I hope, will... um, have a new understanding, and I hope that today you'll uh, have a a different perspective about what worship is. You know, we think at Christmas, and I have lists everywhere. I have a red leather notebook that I keep all year long, and if I hear one of my kids say, yeah, I really need a new pair of headphones, or I really need a this, or I wish I had a that, I go and write it down because I can't trust myself to remember. Because I want to know what their heart is. I want to know what they would like to have because uh, experience has taught me that if I just trust myself to think I know what would be good for them, it's really not a good plan <laughs> because mom doesn't really usually know what <laughs> what the kids want without them telling me. My ideas are, are usually way more practical than what they really want. And so uh, I just have learned to, to just put notes in my phone and, and the reason that I do that is because I want to know what they want. I don't want for them to open something and go, oh, thanks, Mom, I'm sure I'm going to appreciate this one day. <laughs> you know, I want them to open it up and go, oh, awesome, this, I wanted one of these. I can't believe you thought of this. You know, I mean, not, I, want, I want all that. You know, I just, I want to, oh, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, and so that's, my heart is to know their heart and to bless them. And God's heart is that we would give him what he wants. And Deuteronomy 5.29, I'm going to sort of start in the middle here. Deuteronomy 5.29 is God's response to the children of Israel when they said, when God said, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear and worship me with awe-filled reverence and profound respect. 
and keep all my commandments always. Why? Because God's a big, powerful ego guy and he wants us to obey him? No. God's so awesome. So it will go well with them and with their children forever. God wants us to obey him so that he can be good to us. And so this morning, um, I'm prepared to feel like a failure when I leave here because the only subject I can imagine more greater in capacity than to try to teach worship is to try to teach on the love of God. I mean, seriously, I I know that I'm going to feel like I left things unsaid. I know that I'm going to feel like I left things untaught, untouched. But I feel like it's my job today to give you what I can. And that, in in a nutshell, is that it's God's desire. It's what God wants from you and from me for us to worship him. Some of you are thinking, I worship God. I came to a worship service today. This is my worship. I come to worship service. And you're, you're right. Coming to a worship service is an act of worship. Coming here. But I want to present to you that there's a deeper, more significant, more relevant, more important way to take it a step further to worship God. And that is those words that we heard before, and that is awe-filled reverence and profound respect. And here's how we do that. We concentrate and focus our actions, our words, and our affections directly to God. So we stop talking about God, and we start talking to him. Direct interaction with our Heavenly Father is how we worship him in a deeper, more more profound way. Coming to a worship service is definitely worship. God honors that. He's glad you're here. (laughs) But we take it a step further further when we decide that we want to talk to God and honor and respect him personally. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.29 talks about to fear, it actually says to fear the Lord. It says that they would fear me. And that word, and many of you know that fear means to honor and respect. But there's a deeper meaning to that, and it means awe-filled wonder and even terror. The children of Israel experienced this. When God first called them to come to him on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, he gave them instructions, and and his power and his raw presence was coming down on that mountain. And the children of Israel experienced a part of God that I've never experienced, and I'm going to assume you probably haven't either. But it was the, the thunder and the lightning and the clouds and the fire and the ground shook. I mean, seriously, I would love to. I'd love to see that myself, but but something in me tells me, oh, be careful, maybe you really wouldn't. And so they had experienced God in his raw power, and so they knew the fear of the Lord as a terror. Worship is defined by Merriam-Webster as reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power and this is the part I want us to focus on today an act of expressing such reverence we can't worship something isn't worship unless we unless it's expressed and so when you came here today as an act of worship just to attend the service you know there's a old joke I'm not even going to try to tell but it's something about you know being I was in the Lord's house in spirit, you know, it was like, you know, mentally, I, you know, I was there with you. Can't do that. We can't, we have to get up and get this body ready and we have to come, don't we, for it to count. And so it's an expression. And so God wants for us to express our worship to him. I have a little video that's just for fun. It's uh, Tim Hawkins, and it's a video about raising hands, which is an expression of worship, okay? So let's, let's show this for you guys. 
Oh yeah, we don't have to have the intro. <laughs> I'm kidding. And I know I that each to church you. has its own worship style, you know, which is cool. Some people are more expressive in worship, some people more subtle, and it's all good. Um, I go to a church that's pretty expressive in worship. It's um, it's a hand raising church. That's what it is, right? That's what you know. Anybody here go to a hand raising church? Anybody here? Sweet. Who here does not go to a hand raising church? <laughs> Some of you are trying. You're like, I can't. I want to, Tim. I need to get some momentum. <laughs> totally cool. But hey, if you're not used to going to a hand raising church, you want to go and join us. Feel free to join us, but don't feel like you got to join right in. Okay, start slow. We got a lot of different hand raises that we use. We actually have names for our hand raises. So I'm gonna walk you through real quick, okay, what they are, just to let you know. Say you're at my church, music is rocking. Start slow, hands in the pockets, a little elbow flap, you're fine. Very subtle, get warmed up, get your heart rate up. When you're warmed up, start with the first one. Ready, carry the TV. Carry the TV, that's our first one. Very subtle. Go to big screen, big screen, a little wider. Next one's my fish was this big. My fish was this big. If you're a liar, you can go out there. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Jesus loves you. Grace. Next one's hold my baby. Hold my baby. Got dueling light bulbs. That's our next one, dueling light bulbs. We got goalpost. Everybody knows goalpost. Throw in a heartburn. A lot of people like to do heartburn. Double heartburn right back to goalpost. What's my favorite? Mufasa. Mufasa, that's my favorite. <laughs> the circle of life. <laughs> Tim, can you go higher? Yes, you can. You can take one hand, go a bunch of different stuff. Pointer, hatchet, schoolroom. <laughs> Release the doves, give the Lord a high five. Press it out. A lot of women like to wash the window. Wash the window. And when you're comfortable there, go for the big three. Village people, Rocky, touchdown. There you go. There's your big three. <laughs> I love him. Uh, there are many, many ways to express a, your worship to God. And, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not trying to, um, you know, put any pressure on anyone to raise their hands by showing that video. It's just that is a common expression in worship. And um, every way that we worship, if it's to the Lord, I believe it's holy. And I believe God respects it and receives our worship. And um, if, if you want to challenge that, I, I, I just um, say talk about the sons of Korah and the censors. Okay, look that up. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.27, this is the, the verse before, uh, two verses before, 27 and 28. Let's look at, look at what happened with the children of Israel before God said this to them, before God said, oh, that they had such a heart in them. What happened? Let's look at that. God said, you, Moses, I'm sorry, the children of Israel said, you, Moses, go near and listen to everything that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us everything that the Lord our God speaks to you. And we will listen and do it. The Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of this people, which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all that they have spoken. So the children of Israel are saying, okay, we're scared. This shaken mountain, fire, smoke is scary. Moses, you, you run on up there. You think this is a good idea. You go let him talk to you, and then you tell us, and we'll do. And God honored their heart. Their heart was, whatever you come down and say that he said, we will do it. But we're too afraid to go up there. They didn't want to go through the consecration process. They didn't trust themselves to go through and make themselves consecrated before they would see such a holy God. And so I, I really feel like their attitude was, God, you, uh, Moses, you think this is a good idea? You, you run on, and we'll just do anything that you say that he says. And God said this to them at that time. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. And if you look at a lot of different translations, it was, this is how one reads. It's, oh, that they would always have, as they do now have, such a heart in them, that they would fear and worship me. And so God is, God is saying, you all have the right heart. 
You're saying that whatever I tell Moses, you're going to obey. And that's the right, oh, that you would always have this in you. And so God wants for us to have a heart in us that says whatever God's servant says, that God says, I'm going to obey. And so it is his heart that we have a heart. And I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about what if you don't have that heart. We'll talk about that in a minute. God gave the children of Israel instructions on how to approach him on the mountain, like I already said, so that they wouldn't be killed by his raw awesomeness. His first choice was for the children of Israel to prepare themselves and come up to him first face to face. That was what God wanted, first of all. And they sent Moses. Plan, plan B had to be created which actually wasn't plan B, but that was God's desire. So Exodus 26, 33 says, when God was giving Moses the the specific instructions to build the tabernacle, here's God again, wanting to be close to his people. So God told them, he said, you shall hang a veil from the hooks and shall bring the ark of the testimony there within the veil. The veil shall separate for you the holy place and the holy of holies. This this scripture shows that God, there's a priest now that's going to go into the Holy of Holies for the children of Israel, just as Moses went up for the children of Israel. So here's another substitute between God's people and God himself. But look at John 10, 7. Because that was not what God wanted. God wanted to be face to face with his people. So Jesus came and said in John 10, 7, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and live forever and will go in and out, that's in and out of God's presence, freely and find pasture or spiritual security. So once again, God makes a way for his people to come face to face with him. Now we don't have to have a high priest. Jesus is our high priest. And that door between the holy place and the holy of holies is Jesus Christ. Do you have Jesus Christ in your heart today? Have you received him as your Savior? Then you have what it takes to be able to go in to God Almighty, the Most High God, the self-existent one. You have that high priest in you so that you can go in to the holy of holies. You can worship God in a way that literally takes your spirit person. You know, you, you know that you're a spirit. This body is just our vehicle. The spirit that, that you are can go be with the spirit that God is in a spiritual place. While your body is here on earth, your spirit can go and worship God in the Holy of Holies. I don't know who did that. The spirit that you are. Have you ever seen somebody lying in a coffin and they don't look anything like themselves? We've used this example over and over again. It's because themselves are not there. What makes them them is gone. It's their spirit. This is just clay that we use to get around on this earth. We are earth. We're made of the same components of the earth because that's how God created us from the dust of the earth. A lot of worship scriptures point back to us being the earth. But this person that we are, this spirit that we are, can go and be with God in the spirit when we worship him. So heaven and earth can literally connect in worship. In worship, once again, just like God wanted it originally, we can be face to face with God Almighty. We can be in his presence because of Jesus. So how do we do it? How do we worship? Psalms 59, 17 talks about us worshiping with our voice. And there are tons of scriptures about worshiping with our voice, lifting up our voices, making proclamations to the Lord, um, telling of God's good news. These, uh, These over and over and over, the word talks about us worshiping with our voice. But it says, I will lift up my voice and sing your praise, O my strength, for you came to my defense. O God, you have shown me your loving mercy. Psalms 134.2 talks about worshiping with our hands. 
This is very scriptural to lift up our hands. 134.2 says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Do you know what we call this room? It's the sanctuary. (laughs) There's a scripture that says lifting holy hands to the Lord. And I've heard people say all my life, my hands aren't holy. Well, guess what? Jesus' blood is big enough, powerful enough to make even your hands holy. And these hands too. So when we belong to the Lord, we are sanctified, redeemed, and righteous by Jesus. And our hands become holy. (laughs) And so when we lift up our hands to the Lord, they are holy because Jesus made them holy. Hannah's worship to God is one of the most beautiful scriptures. She says in 1 Samuel 2, 2, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. Neither is there any rock like my God. I love that scripture. This morning in our um, responsive reading, we read how that kings, all the kings would worship God. Daniel 4.37, Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. How did Nebuchadnezzar know that God was able to humble those who walked in pride? Because he'd just been humbled. He had just had those Hebrew boys cast into fire because they wouldn't bow down to him. And what happened? Awesome God, those Hebrew boys God, delivered them, kept them from even smelling like smoke. If God has done things for you, if he's delivered you, worship could come, should come pouring out of your heart. And what has he done for you? Did you wake up this morning? Did you breathe? <laughs> the word says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's a reason to, to praise the Lord. That's a reason to worship. Psalm 63, if you're taking notes, that's an awesome psalm of praise to look at. Psalm 71, verses 22 through 24, says, I will also praise you with the harp, talking about instruments. You have to have your hands to play those instruments. For your faithfulness, oh my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O holy one of Israel. My lips will shout for joy. When I sing praises to you, my soul also, which you have redeemed. My tongue will talk of your righteousness. These are all ways to worship and praise God. Our lips, our tongue, our talk, our hands, our breath. Not only do we pray, not only do we praise and worship God with our breath through instruments, but our very vocal cords are instruments that breath comes through to make sound. So we are living instruments for the Lord to worship him. Why do you think that the Lord wants us to worship him? If he's self-existent, he identifies himself as the self-existent one. So he doesn't need us. He doesn't need us for anything. Why then would we, why would he tell us to worship him? It's almost as though he needs something from us. But it isn't true. Repeatedly through the Bible, he tells us to worship him. And I feel like the answer to that is Deuteronomy 29, our text scripture today, and that is so that it may go well with you and your children. God wants us to worship him, not because he needs it. He has elders standing around 24-7. He has all of heaven worshiping him. He wants us to worship him because we need it. Because by taking the focus off of ourselves and focusing on him, It takes our spirit, it takes our focus, it takes our lives from concentrating and imploding on our own situations. And we reach up to the one who is our redeemer, who is our helper, who is our strength. If we just concentrate every minute of the day on what we have going on, we're going to be in a mess. But if we worship our God, We take our focus from our things and we put it on his things and he's the answer. When we tell of the greatness of our God, it reminds us of his power, of his attentiveness, of his unfailing love. And what does that do when we do that? It builds our faith. When you start saying, okay, Lord, I'm in a mess. (laughs) I'm in a mess here, Lord. But you know what? I remember the last mess I was in, and I can't believe how you solved that for me. I thought I was at the end of 
of my days, but you bailed me out. You delivered me. When you start remembering the things that God did for you and worshiping him and praising him, it builds your faith. Another reason God wants us to worship for us. The act of worship itself is a testimony to unbelievers. Our worship and our praise of our God tells those around us that our faith is real and that our God is real. Um, I want to I, I want to I debate whether to do this or not. This is a quote. This is from a book. The, the title of the book is Paddle Your Own Canoe, and it's by Nick Offerman. Anybody know who Nick Offerman is? If you watch Parks and Rec, he is the actor that plays the character Ron Swanson. And he wrote a book called Paddle Your Own Canoe. And this is a quote about why he no longer partakes in religion or wants anything to do with God. And I am editing as I go. Uh, I remember sitting in my seat at the far right stage of the altar while the congregation would slog through a group recitation like the Apostles' Creed. We believe in, in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. In the most Pavlovian way, the cultish, soulish tone in which this group of 200 people would repeat this creed of purpose, it was meant to resonate like a mission statement but it lent no favor to nor even indicated any apparent awareness of what they were saying. And he says it's as if they were saying, now we say this part, we get the talking over with so we can go home to the football game. One Sunday in my mid-teens, I really heard them droning on, and I found it quite upsetting. I thought, listen to what you're saying. You're repeating this supposed profession of your faith, and I'll wager you literally couldn't tell me what you're talking about right now. Heavily edited. The words of the creed, as well as this whole notion, are so profound to re-up your faith week in and week out. But the meaning is utterly lost on you. And this was his summation because of him witnessing this on this one day. This is not working. This service is not working for people. I'm not interested in taking part in this because it doesn't seem to be working. This was supposed to be a worship service that he was attending. But the people's droning, their complete disinterest in what they were reciting, made him think it wasn't worth his time, he goes on to say later. Heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. If our acts of worship are boring, <laughs> if it's laborious to us, then why should non-believers and non-Christians have any interest in what we're doing or any interest in our God? If our worship service bores us and we're convinced that God is real, why would someone coming in from the outside want to subscribe and join us in our faith if we ourselves sound bored and unconvinced? We've talked about this a lot, and for those of you who get this and who have made changes, I apologize that I'm going to repeat it, but it re keeps coming up repeatedly. And so I want to repeat it once again, and that is that I've heard people who have asked for prayer and received favorable results or received what I consider an answer to prayer, and I've heard them say I was lucky. I've heard people who called out to God for help say it was a coincidence that things worked out well for them. And then we go into the thing that I know some of you could finish for me, and I'm sorry. But this is something that I feel like we have to get over. We have to learn this as children of God. And that is that when we see something that reminds us of our loved ones who've gone on from this life, our loved ones who are in heaven and with the Lord, when we see a butterfly, when we see a hummingbird, when we see something that our loved ones loved, to give credit 
to our loved ones instead of to the maker, instead of to the creator of those beautiful things, makes our loved ones idols to us. There I said it. Deal with it. (laughs) God created these things for us to enjoy and to have all kinds of an effect on this planet that we live in that he made for us. And then we go and give credit and say, oh, I saw a monarch today. Aunt Sissy must be sending it to me so I can enjoy it. (laughs) Aunt Sissy, if she's literally in heaven, she's got better things to do than send you butterflies. Okay? And if when we I see people on Facebook who I love, I love these people, but they seem to think that their dead relatives send them sunrises and sunsets to let them know they're thinking of them. Sunrises and sunsets were made by our great God for a greater purpose. And our loved ones who are with the Lord do not have anything to do with creating these beautiful things for us to enjoy. There's a thing going on now where everybody says that if you see a cardinal it's a, in your yard, it's a visitor from heaven. Baloney. <laughs> it is not. It is, this, this disturbs me, people, and let me tell you why. Because Romans 1.20 says this. This is the reason these beautiful things are, are in existence. This is the reason all birds aren't tan. Glad my husband isn't here because he likes tan. But anyway, oh. Uh, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, okay? God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. His creation is how some people, that's the only way that some people are going to understand his invisible qualities and his amazing power so that people are without excuse. I fail so poorly that my life and my testimony can't win everybody to the Lord. So God has to have something else. He can't can't rely on me. I do my best, but I fail. I flop hard. I, I mess up. I disappoint myself far more than I disappoint anyone else, I promise. So God has, a, has this amazing creation in place so that when we fail, there's still a way for unbelievers to see that there is an amazing, awesome God who created all things. So that the very creation will speak to unbelievers. And when we give credit to our deceased loved ones for the creation, what do you think that is telling an unbeliever? It's completely discrediting and discounting that this creation was for a purpose for them, for them to see. Nope, that's Aunt Sissy. That's not God. You know what? I had started to think maybe that was God. That's Aunt Sissy, huh? She, she likes sunsets. Hmm, all right, well. Undone. When God's own children refuse to give him credit for the things that he's made, the things that are intended to show his power and divine nature. It creates a vacuum in the world. And then you want to hear, you want to know that there's there's another phase to this. We do those things while while refusing to express our worship to God. And then we look at the world and we say, what a mess. And we start looking for who to blame for the mess. We're giving credit for God's creation to somebody who is not here anymore. We refuse to worship, and then we start looking for who to blame for this mess we're in. Can you see that that is just completely messed up? We need to give God glory and honor and credit that he is due. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. It's why we breathe and why we live and why we move. To worship God. We compliment and applaud people every day, all day long. We hit like. We hit applaud. We are at things and we applaud things and we weren't even paying attention. We don't even know why we're clapping sometimes. But the group is applauding, so we applaud. And then we come into church and somebody wants to give an applaud offering, a praise offering to God, and we say, I don't clap. 
But we'll clap for things we don't even understand when we're in a big stadium. We don't even know what the guy said. But everybody else is, so, okay. But the holy things that we're willing, that, that should be for God, we hold back on. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear and worship me with awe-filled reverence and profound respect. The great thing about meeting God's needs and fulfilling his desires is that he will create in us what we're lacking if we have a heart for it. So, for instance, you might say, I wish that I had this passion to worship God. I, I wish, you know, I, I would like to be like that. I'm just not like that. Guess what? <laughs> you can ask the Lord to create in you his desire for you, and he will do it for you. King David didn't have a clean heart. King David had lust and desire and failure and sin and murder, and the list just goes on and on and on of all the things that he had done. But he went before God Almighty in Psalm 51, and he said, Create in me a clean heart. Let me tell you what. He was a lot further from a clean heart then you are a heart of worship. And if it's our desire for God to create a heart of worship in us, all we need to do is ask. We might say that we don't enjoy worship services. I wish I did, but I just don't see the value in it. I don't see how that is a good use of my time. You know, that time at home on Sunday morning, just that restful time, that's, that, that's valuable to me. But getting dressed and rushing up to the church. But I wish I did. I wish I valued it. I wish it meant more to me than it does. If, we, if you ask God for that, he will help you to see the value. Maybe this church service isn't what, what you'd like for it to be. Ask the Lord to help you to get us there. Ask the Lord to use you to make this the service that he wants it to be and what you want it to be, what you need it to be. God will help us to have whatever we need to please him. That's the awesome thing. You know, sometimes you you meet someone and you just say, you know, I just don't like being around that person. I just want to stay away from them. But God has a heart to say, you know what, I want to be around that person and I want to create in them what they need so that we can be together. Let's ask for a heart of worship today. Is anybody in here willing to? to go further, to express your worship to God more? Are you willing to give to God what he wants? I'm not asking you to raise your hands. If you're threatened by that, rest. (laughs) That's not what this is about. If, If you feel like, you know, other expressive worship means are are in some way daunting to you, just rest. This is between you and God. This is about your heart wanting to reach out to God Almighty and lift him up. Brother James, would you please come? I want for us to sing a song right now. It's Thou Art Worthy. It's hymn number 100 in the blue book. And guys back there, I'm so sorry. This is something that we developed at at the last minute. The words to this song are found in Revelation. Revelation 4.11, and it says, Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. Glory, honor, and power. And I think a lot of you probably know this or have heard it. But could we stand together right now and just offer the Lord worship with our voices?
as you go through your week, I just encourage you to take a moment and when you see something pretty, when you see something in creation inspiring, worship God. When you're overwhelmed and you don't know what to do, worship God. Because worship brings us into his presence. And if we're in his presence, we're strengthened, we're calmed, we receive his peace. Have a heart of worship. Ask the Lord to develop a heart of worship in you so that it will go well with you and with your children. Let's pray. Father, you are worthy. You're worthy of all of our praise and all of our adoration. You're worthy of every compliment that ever comes out of our mouth to be to you and to you only. You are good, you're righteous, you're merciful, you're just. You're everything that we are not. But, Lord, we ask for you to make us like you so that we can please you. Father, please put in us a heart of worship so that we can give you that awe-filled reverence, the time that you would like for us to spend with you so that we can be face-to-face with you. Holy Spirit, I ask that if anyone in this room takes, takes me at my word, if anyone in this room begins to have a heart inclined to worship you. Holy Spirit, I ask for you to rush in like a flood and let them feel the presence of Almighty God. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you raise your hand as I give the benediction? I just ask that the Lord would bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. I bless you with a heart of worship this morning that you could go out of this place with peace and comfort and joy in your heart to live a life for the Lord that would draw other people to God. I bless you with peace. I bless you with abundance. In Jesus' name, amen.